Hey everybody, uh, thanks for connecting again. A uh, special day because uh, today we get to hear from all of you. Uh, a couple of logistics before we start. Uh, we are going to run out of time. There is roughly around 40 or so teams with three minutes allocated to every team. So this has to work like clockwork for the whole thing to play out. Uh, but I'm just letting you know that uh, keep in mind that this session will be around two hours or something. If you have to disconnect, don't worry, we will be recording everything. Uh, number two, everybody is going to participate as we go through. Uh, I'll be the timekeeper, so I will cut you off in three minutes time. Uh, and the goal would be is that everybody else that's listening in take active notes, and then we will be sharing those notes with the teams so that you can provide feedback to others' ideas it's very important that everybody is engaged in one single team, but of course you are allowed to participate in uh, and provide ideas and uh, share resources to every other team. Uh, I think it's important to understand that many of the participants of the class have experiences in certain fields and you might not have chosen that team because you're interested in building your skills in another space while you can spill have a lending hand once you hear the kinds of problems. I have looked through the decks very briefly and I cannot tell you how excited I am for this day. This is the real kickoff for the class. And I think if this excitement is what prevails, we have a lot of work cut out for ourselves. Uh, I wanna say one word and then I'm gonna to transition to Tyler with the list of the order. Take a look in the chat. Uh, the proposal is that one person will be presenting per team uh, so that we don't have multiple people in switching. Several people asked, what are the expectations at the end of the project? I often break down a project into five stages in some sense. Uh, you know, the first stage really is a conceptualization that you're really trying to even understand what problem you're even interested in. What is the space that you would like to contribute to? The second stage is what the stage we are in today where you have identified an audience. You have some data to base the factors of why you are working on this problem. And then the third phase, which is the most critical phase, which we will transitioning from the first one to the next, is when you have either data calculations and a very solid grounding or experiments to prove and disprove whether your approach can actually scale to the class of problem we are interested in. And then of course the fourth stage is validation of that work in a setting that measures or scales to the problem you're interested in. And then the fifth stage is scale up. And the purpose of this class is we will try to get all the way to stage three. We are already somewhere between one and two. You've all identified problems you're passionate about, but really we will use technical details, experiments, uh, different teams will have completely different approaches, but you need to come out of this class validating that the solution that you have come up with truly matches the scale of the problem. It's not that you've implemented everything, but you can convince somebody else that this is the right approach. So we'll expand a lot of ideas after this session and then narrow it down back again. And that's the expectation, folks who can do that as well as possible as well as possible. So with that note, uh, we are going to transition. This is going to be a roller coaster. Uh, Tyler, I'll pass this to you. The first presenter is uh, Ruta and her team. Uh, and I'm gonna keep the timer. So Tyler, you can begin. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Manu. And thanks everyone for joining. I'm super excited. Um, we're just gonna get started. Um, some of these presentations, we're gonna have to deal with uh, slight non-optimalities in the format. Um, some of them I think are going to be not in exact presenter mode, but I think that's okay. As long as we can see the slides, I uh, will make it good. So yeah, we'll get started. Uh, Ruta, you and your group are first. Um, I know, so, so I'm going to be controlling all the presentations. Uh, that's the current plan. I know some of you had some fancy animations, but I think just given the time, uh, we're going to stick with, I'll just control the presentations from, from what you've submitted. So we're going to start off, uh, Ruta, I will ask you to unmute and I will start sharing my screen. Um, yeah. 
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Rupa. I'm a second year master's student at Stanford and the project that my team and I are deciding to solve is frugal PP sanitization. And by solve, I mean a gently attempt to solve because it's a really big problem. So as you know, there's a worldwide PPE shortage um, as people are helping to fight COVID. And when I talk about PPE, I mean specifically for COVID uh, healthcare workers. There's a lot of different types of PPE. There's also um, ones that are used for uh, firefighters and for just a lot of different uh, genres in which you need protective equipment. Uh, and this map that you see on the left is the shortage just across the United States. So if you expand that out into lower resource countries, you can imagine that the shortage itself and the population will also scale. Uh, PPE for COVID is pretty expensive to sanitize and about 200,000 uh, protective equipment like masks and uh, full body suits are discarded uh, in India every day. So that comes out to about 6 million per month at about 1,000 to 2,000 rupees per PPE kit. And that's a cost of 82 million US dollars per month to the Indian healthcare system. So we're trying to find a way to either sanitize them or reuse them. And you can go to the next slide, Tyler. So there are a couple of different solutions that we've been looking at on our idea board. The first is UVC decontamination, and that involves uh, using UV as uh, implied to sanitize masks. Uh, one of our teammates, Treyas, has already used this in the field of dentistry. So we're gonna see if we can expand that solution, and find a bigger way to scale it. Another solution that was suggested on our idea board is just washing the things, putting them through the laundry. And that's something that seemed harder to scale because there are a lot of countries where washing is done by hand, on a washing rock rather than through a system with a machine. Um, so we're looking for whether or not that would be a viable approach and if we can uh, quantify exactly how sanitized something is by putting it through a washing machine. Um, and the last uh, space of ideas that we're also looking at is perhaps just recreating PPE in a biodegradable or lower cost way so that when you do either eventually discard it or um, end up trying to sanitize it, instead of having to sanitize it, uh, or instead of having to find a way to recycle it, you can just let it biodegrade. So our current team right now, and you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Our current team is me, Harini, uh, Kashmira. Uh, the three of us have met and talked about it so far. Uh, Thivish is a plastic surgeon in India. We haven't been able to talk to him in person just yet, but he's been super helpful um, in understanding uh, how people actually use PPE and in understanding what, resource, what resources are available in, specifically in India. Uh, because that's one of the locales that we're going to be focusing on. And Treyas is another Stanford student who's worked on UVC before. And our mentor is going to be Dr. Nicole Starr, um, who's worked on the N95 Decon project along with Manu. Okay, so, I think time's up. That was fantastic. Uh, we are going to leave comments for uh, everybody is required to be writing your notes and threads. Uh, so, and from time to time, uh, we will uh, wait for people to make sure that they're writing notes. Let's transition to the next team. Uh, All right, um, so the, the next uh, team, sorry, let me just stop the share so I can actually see things. I should get a monitor one day. Okay, who's up next? Uh, next Manabesh. is Manabesh, let's see. Uh, looks like there are two Manabeshes. I'm going to unmute this one. And sorry for going through this so rapidly, but I think it is valuable for everybody to get a chance to actually present. So, all right, uh, let's give this a shot. Manabesh, can you uh, can you talk? Does this work? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Shall I start? Go for it. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Manavesh from Team Frugal Onco, and we are here to present our idea of developing home-based cancer kits uh, so that it can be used by anyone with a simple paper-based solution. So the problem that we are discussing and dealing with is that diagnosing cancer in any setting is not feasible. It requires tertiary hospital setting. It requires a complex diagnostic setup, requires radio imaging, requires invasive samples being taken as biopsies, and as a, a complete blood panel is required for discussing and uh, divulging out what type of cancer it is. And then clinicians are brought in, expert oncologists are brought in, 
so that we can age that particular type of cancer. So it is overall a very lengthy process and it requires a lot of manpower input with trained professionals. And the problem which we see in resource limited countries like in India or in China, African nations is that uh, the uh, people don't get access to those uh, settings easily. They have to travel miles. They have to reach to a particular place which has all those uh, resources available. So for that, uh, we need a simpler and easier way of diagnosing and detecting cancer. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. So what we're proposing is that uh, using the frugal uh, solutions that have been discussed over the uh, few past weeks, what we can use there uh, using uh, the concept of lateral immunoassay in paper-based uh, approach for diagnosing particular type of cancer. Now, what we think that would work is using for biomarkers. A lot of biomarker studies are already undergoing and various clinical researches are being undergone on that, using protein biomarkers as well as DNA uh, genomic biomarkers. What we are proposing is that if we can use particular type of protein biomarkers, say more than two or more biomarkers can be incorporated and imprinted in a paper-based strip which can detect particular type of cancer. Of course, this uh, easier way of diagnosis would come with its limitation, but it would help in preliminary diagnosis and it would re drastically reduce the cost of um, diagnosing with complex ways. That's why it will like give a precise and precision based uh, method methodology for clinicians to focus on one particular type of cancer rather than doing a barrage of tests for diagnosing and coming to the particular point. So. We can go to the next slide, please. So our team is fairly young and new, and we are in need of a mentor because most of our background are from uh, biological sciences only, biochemistry, and a couple of them are from material science engineers. So we would need uh, support from both uh, clinicians as well as uh, design engineers who would help us designing the final product as well as in giving input into the clinical aspect of the same so that we can detect particular type of biomarkers. Thank you. Okay, time's up. Uh, that was fantastic. And Manabesh, I'll assign a cancer-oriented mentor. Uh, you know, it's it really what you described is really at the cutting edge of cancer research per se, whether diagnosis uh, for several types of cancers can actually be done in a, a completely different setting. Uh, so next is Liz. Oh, hi, hello. Can you hear me well? Perfect. Okay, awesome. Tyler, let's reduce the transition time. We will get better at it. All right, so I'll start. So my name is Liz Albertorio. Um, I'm speaking from North Carolina. I'm presenting on behalf of a team that's comprised of outstanding individuals. Um, and although our backgrounds are pretty diverse, we share the interests of the topic of antimicrobial resistance. And to define, it, define that is when microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, and fungi change over time and no longer respond to current medicine. And according to the United Nations, uh, in, the, in the next probably 25 years, we will have 10 million human deaths that will happen each year. Um, I say humans, but it also affects um, animals as well. The causes of antimicrobial resistance are very multifactorial, um, and they include excessive usage of antimicrobials, lack of adequate policy, and a lack of the discovery of new antimicrobials. Um, this topic is very complex, and it has many fronts that we, that we can address, but as a group, we have decided to focus on antimicrobial discovery. There's this paradox that there's a need uh, for antimicrobials and a discovery for it, but pharmaceutical companies are not putting a lot of money on that. So one underestimated source for new antimicrobials are plants, which some of them have shown antimicrobial properties. But with over 300,000 vascular plants on earth and an extensive traditional knowledge that um, spans a large number of cultures, we asked ourselves if there was an affordable way that we could test uh, the antimicrobial capacities of local plants anywhere in the world. Uh, slide number two. So this topic, it's kind of addressed at North Carolina State University in the laboratory of Slacko Komenerski. So he developed this kit that uses inexpensive materials from the lab to test antimicrobial capacity of plants. But even though it's simple, there are opportunities for improvement. Um, and in here, we show the goals that we have agreed as a team. Um, and it includes adapting the kit at different low resource settings, uh, crowdsourcing, diverse diverse plans, the name of them, um, and embedding this effort within science, citizen science and school communities. Slide number three. 
uh, we have divided the project into different sections. And here is a picture of the amazing team that I am part of. And each of us uses our experiences and expertise to come up with the products that address the primary goal. Um, although the expertise is very diverse, we are still open to contributors and mentors who can refine our project. Um, the ideas can be instrumentation, how to adapt it to different settings and data collection. And also we are looking for ideas to see if there's something already being done um, that could provide perspective to the project. Um, thank you and I look forward to learning from the other ideas. Fantastic, thank you so much. Mario, can you unmute the next person? Oh, do I have the power? Uh, I will make sure you have the power. I think you have the power. Okay. Amanda, so if I go in here, I think that'll be easier so I don't have to unshare yes. my screen every time. Yeah. Amanda Hi. has been unmuted. Hi. Go for it. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. Let's go. Um, so our project is all about snares. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, snares are really simple traps um, used for hunting. And they're kind of just a very simple loop that's very easy to make. And the idea is kind of if something is trapped in it and it tries to escape, the snare tightens. and um, the animal is caught. Now as a human, I can just use my fingers and kind of wiggle my way out of it, but most people don't, most animals don't have opposable thumbs. So it turns out snares are super, super gruesome. I was thinking of including some pictures, but I really didn't want to shock anyone. If you you know, have a stomach, go online, check it out. It's, it's a horrible way uh, to catch animals. Um, and if they survive it, they're often very crippled and we just put up some statistics there. Um, and originally when uh, Kishore put this on the idea board, he was particularly interested in um, snares that are used for illegal wildlife poaching. Um, and uh, particularly how we find those snares because they're very well hidden. They're just used by, they're made by wires um, that are really hard to spot. Um, so that was kind of our starting point. But looking into it, um, it we realized that snares are a problem all over the world. And some places they're legal and some places they're illegal. There's like some rules about how are we supposed to use them? But I think anyone can, anyone who cares about animal welfare even a little bit can tell that they really shouldn't be used at all. So um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so we kind of uh, tried to look and into like uh, why people set snares and it turns out that it goes far beyond just um, poachers. Uh, people use them for hunting because they are hungry. There's, we found a discussion board where a scientist uh, the conservationists told the story where they had massive problems with illegal snaring in an area with protected species. And the way they uh, solved that problem was that they um, gave out food for people who returned snares and they got rid of all the wire in the area and suddenly no one could make snares anymore. Um, so it's, it's a very diverse problem. In the UK, there's a massive problem with snares because people use them to hunt hot foxes. It's just, it's very diverse. So we've been thinking about maybe um, not just focusing on the illegal wildlife poaching, but just generally thinking, can we make a dent in the problem of snares worldwide? Um, and yeah, so the, the, the main thing is the detection of snares. So we had a bit of a look at, uh, there's been some studies, uh, conception studies about using ground penetrating radar. So we were thinking, could we put those on drones? How, um, like how, how would that work in different giraffes? Um, stuff like that. Um, there's dogs on there. I found a dog trainer who, claims they have trained dogs to find um, snares. So I was thinking of maybe interviewing them, seeing what principle they even use in this, I don't know. Um, so that's kind of why that why there's like odd questions there. Uh, it's a very big problem and we're not actually sure where we're gonna end up contribu contributing to it. Um, yeah. All right, 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, I'm Amanda, I'm based in the UK. Kishore is the guy who made the uh, thing on the idea board. He's based in India. Please let us know if there's anyone we should reach out to because we're newbies. <laughs> Oh yeah, we come awesome. from engineering, so background. Sweet, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, we already did this one, and I think we're on paleontology now. Uh, Mario, I think we need to skip one, one presenter who I think already went, and then we go on to the next. Oh, how are we doing? Can are people here? Yep. Oh, Manu is somehow. I was muted. Sorry, I meant to say in my list it said it's Eve's. Is that not the next, or is it her shit? Uh, Tyler, you maybe, let me know, and I'll maybe be Eve's here. is good. I think. Eve's. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Clean water, huh? So uh, our, our project is about drinking water. 
to bring in drinking water in rural areas all over the world. Uh, it's a big problem. Like uh, one fourth of the people in the world don't have access to clean water and have to drink water that has, am I still there or? Yeah. You're still there, we can hear okay, you. Okay. So uh, like one fourth of the people in the world don't have access to good water and this is terrible. This brings not only a problem for the person who gets sick, but also for the whole family who has to take care of them. So in terms of economy, in terms of health, in terms of pollution also, because of course, all the places that have to drink bottled water, all these bottles are going somewhere also. So it's something that attacks many, many different problems. Uh, say in uh, the WHO, H -I -O -W -H -O, says there's uh, 780 million people who lack basic drinking water. And, uh, you know, there's 485,000 people that die each year from diarrhea, which is, I mean, we shouldn't be at this point anymore. And there's so many ways to treat water. And among our ideas is, well, first is to try to protect water that we already have. You know, there's streams, there's uh, water that we already use, which would be recovery of water that we're using and we're contaminating by throwing it back to the rest of the water that is even more dirty. Uh, so recycling would be another issue. And then there is capturing water that's, you know, available that like rain and fog. There's some pretty interesting uh, ideas about fog capturing nowadays. And getting to the final step, which is really filtration and sterilization of water. So what we're trying to do is figure out a way, well, to recycle it, we're, we're thinking about doing ponds. You know, there's ponds that can oxidize and then filtrate naturally the water through plants and sand and, you know, taking away, uh, and then using the activated carbon to, you know, suck away metals and, and other chemicals. But the whole idea is, one is to make these ponds and design a pond that is simple and easy to make for a small community because this is rural areas, uh, the project, but also to make some kind of a filter that could be almost made in sites, not something that's produced and sent to the people, but probably, you know, design it and find a way that it's, it could be made anywhere. Uh, we found something really interesting that they're using wood, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pieces of, of uh, conifers yeah. that have very, Tyler, very... Can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that wood that has very, very small cells that won't let pass uh, bacteria. It will let, let pass viruses. So we got to figure out a way to stop viruses. But uh, we read a really interesting paper uh, from, I think it was MIT, that, that explained about this wood and the water going through it. And you know, particles getting caught in the first two millimeters of the wood. The only main problem there is that it has to be freshly cut wood. It can't be dry. So it's not easy to produce and send to the places. So it'll only work in places where they have access to conifers. Okay, we're out of time. That's okay, thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, let's switch to next is Hershit. And Hershit, you're already mute, unmuted, so you can start presenting. Harshit, can you hear us? Harshit, can you hear us? Uh, okay, I... Yeah, hello. Yeah, okay. now I can, now I can. Yeah. So, uh, so the idea is basically, to, can we develop a smartphone app that can be used by citizen scientists in India to differentiate a fossil specimen from a rock and use this crowdsource data for scientific research? Uh, so paleontology in India is comparatively speaking very less. It's a dying science, like I said last week. Um, and we have the second largest dinosaur hatchery in the world, which, which is also a World Heritage Site, but it took 21 years to build a museum on it. And also, you know, whatever little fossils we have, these are stored in a poor condition and no research or not much research is done on them. And there are no laws safeguarding fossils and deciding who can or who and who cannot collect them. There's also development, which is destroying sites. There's vandalism, which is basically stealing of public property and fossils are public property. But still we stumble upon these uh, discoveries 
like the Jurassic sea monster, which is an ichthyosaur, and this is one of the first specimens from the southern part of the world, which is which has contributed uh, immensely to the understanding of this bio historical biogeography. And when it comes to people, I think everyone is fascinated by fossils, but when it comes to doing research on them or some job, there are no opportunities and no financial conditions and training. Uh, but there is an am ambitious program called the Time. Uh, Time is basically an abbreviation for the Indian Museum for Earth, which is the first in the Indian his natural history museum coming up, uh, and will house these fossils apart from other natural history specimens. And we have the concerns, we have the solutions. That there is a gap here, which these app will be able to address. Next slide, Tala. Yeah. So this is the basic game plan, and that is this is a different slide. Okay, fine. So we use a smartphone. Uh, so it's like any other citizen science platform where you use a smartphone for taking photos and then freely and, and you can have an app which you can freely download and you can have a, you can register, make an account, have a, have your own page where the contributions are there. And then you can have data entry where you have to pr produce, when you, where you have to enter some data, which is basically just the GPS location, the date of discovery, your name, and also uh, photos again. There's a compulsion here that you should take photos with scale reference and from various angles and send them as one entry so that we can have a good picture of the fossil. The peer review part is a third step, which will uh, make the data which we collect very much scientifically reliable and also potentially fuel the policy and law enforcement in India regarding fossil conservation. And after verification, these can be these observations can be uploaded on the website and sorted through a computer algorithm. And presented and also the contributor can be given credits and uh, a confirmation email and the geodata point submitted can be uploaded on the map uh, hey, another and we are out of time do you want to harsha just say a word about your team who all is in I'm the team the, so first of all this uh, this is the old presentation which i sent so the new one is actually the other one but anyways it's just me say a word about moment. who is in the team yeah. it's just me at the moment yeah. Uh, so the idea would be is this is the moment for you to recruit. So this yeah. is a phenomenal so project. Anybody, is there. Yes. Anybody who wants to please look at it and join. So Harshit, we have to move, keep moving. The next individual yeah. is SRP8759. I don't know who the person ID is, so I can't unmute unless you tell me, Tyler. Do we know what the name of the individual is? Unfortunately, I do not know who the name is. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe in chat if someone. Uh, if that's yeah, you. I already think people I haven't heard. So okay, I we'll think... skip for now, and then we'll go uh, to that one later. Okay, let's start with Costub. So Costub, you're next. Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm from the Space Debris team. Uh, since the start of the space race in the 1950s, there have been thousands of satellites that have been launched, and a lot of them have been decommissioned or have suffered a lot of failures. Due to these, uh, due to these successive failures, we are actually having a lot of space debris and space junk that are in orbit. Uh, estimates put it at nearly over 200,000, and that is just the ones that we can currently track. In fact, we actually do not have a proper count on how much space debris is actually present. The problem right now, uh, the question that can come uh, at this point is why should we worry about space debris? They are, uh, they are thousands, hundreds of kilometers above us and they're not directly affecting us. The problem here is uh, whenever we try to uh, launch satellites or whenever we have satellites currently in orbit, space debris can have the very real danger of crashing into any one of these satellites and causing millions of dollars of worth of damages. Not just, not just that, the space debris also have very, very high orbital velocities. As a result, they can cause quite, se quite severe damage to even the best designed satellites. And uh, on an average, most of the current satellites are forced to do orbital adjustments to avoid space debris that come even a few kilometers in proximity to the satellite. Now, as you can see in the infographic on screen, there are three categories of space debris and what we are focusing on are the low Earth orbit ones. Um, next slide, please. 
So, um, given that space debris are a significant problem that can, that have the potential to cost hundreds of millions of dollars and have already costed a lot of money, it makes sense for us to address it before the uh, uh, feared Kessler syndrome takes over and we get too many debris. So the current solutions include burning up or uh, saving fuel in the stages of the rocket so that we can deorbit it once the mission is over. There have also been attempts to use a net to capture all the debris, but the drag sail did not deploy. There are also other strategies that include harpooning them using high powered lasers, but none of these are exactly frugal or scalable given the problem that we are currently facing. So what we pr propose is to first to create a comprehensive map of the space debris available. And for that, we wish to deploy the power of citizen science. Uh, for that, we have already discussed several approaches like the ones you see on the screen that includes in uh, scaling up of space imagery capture uh, inspired by Operation Moonshot. Thanks, thanks Manu for that. Then high volume image analysis and image stacking to increase the resolution to super level, uh, hyper levels. And then using uh, models of the atmosphere to see if we can find places within the atmosphere where these debris congregate. Uh, the inspiration taken from the Great Pacific Plastic Patch. Since we have ideas that there are streams which can uh, uh, cause these to accumulate. So once we get an idea of these, we'll be able to design more targeted solutions to take out a lot of space debris in a single go, rather than having to deal with each debris individually. So uh, next slide, please. So the current, so the current team uh, are, as you see on the screen, what we do need are people who understand atmospheric science well enough to help us model the atmosphere and also people who are experienced with orbital mechanics and propulsion systems so that we'll be able to think about designing solutions, scalable solutions to attack the problem once we identify a map. Okay, time's up. That's fantastic. Next on my list is Arani. Uh, I'm just enjoying this so much. Uh, I have no clue of time, but I'm trying to push you guys to keep on time. So sorry about that. Um, Arani, you're next. So am I audible? You're you audible. are. Yep. So hello, everyone. I'm representing the non-plastic syringes group, and I'll be talking about the dangers and damages that plastic syringes and metal needles are causing worldwide and in various ecosystems. So we all know that plastic syringes are actually very, very cheap, and they're widely available everywhere. The World Health Organization estimates that around 16 billion injections are administered worldwide with a vast majority, that is around 90%, being used for curative care. Immunizations account for around 5% and the remaining covers other indications, including transfusion of blood or other injectable contraceptives, etc. A majority of these syringes are actually produced for single use, but in lower, uh, lower and middle income interest uh, countries, there has been repeated cases of reuse of these syringes, which has contributed to diseases like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or HIV. Uh, these numbers can vary from like 0.1% in the developed countries to around 75% in some countries in Southeast Asia, like Bhutan, India, Bangladesh, the Maldives, or Korea. Uh, not only reuse is dangerous, but also improper disposal is a huge threat. And this can be uh, causing biohazards or as sharps wastes, which end up in accounting for at least 2 million needle stick injuries in healthcare workers. So, and there is also a recent case of syringe pollution, which has been occurring due to recreational drug activities and syringes being disposed anywhere. And uh, these syringes, they end up in terrestrial landfills in oceans or in beaches or in water bodies, and they finally contribute to even an increase in microplastics in the ocean systems, and that finally end up entering the food chain. And we can only expect these scenarios to turn worse after this recent pandemic. So moving on to slide two. Yeah. Uh, so uh, can we do nothing? Uh, from our literature survey, we did see that we can do something like by changing the syringe material or by changing the syringe design. So improvisations would include making the material more biodegradable or by using materials that can be recycled more times and won't pose a risk of disease contamination. And uh, making improvisations in design would include needle-free techniques and dissolvable microneedles that won't contribute to sharps wastes. However, both material and design innovations must remember to take uh, use, make use of present technologies that are widely available so that these uh, syringes are frugal and can be manufactured anywhere. 
Uh, also, uh, altogether, this is a problem of changing both materials and design while we optimize the cost to, be, uh, to beat an already frugal system that is wreaking havoc on the planet. Mm -hmm. And moving on, uh, this is our team. Yep. And we, we would actually need mentors who have some experience in material science or in frugal manufacturing or prototyping. So that would help save the world from a plastic disaster. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so time's up and then I'll connect uh, the team to actually the inventor of uh, needle-free uh, injections. So you kind of see the perspective of how one frugal solution causes another class of problems. I think just beautiful example here. Uh, okay, next is Benjamin. I am just unmuting you. Okay, can you hear me? Perfect. All okay, yours, Benjamin. Hey, I'm, I'm Benny from Israel and I'll be representing the uh, frugal aid, um, detection, uh, inf infection detection team, and we'll be dealing with how can uh, health practitioners rapidly differentiate between uh, viral and bacterial infections in a resource constrained environment. As uh, there is, uh, Eves, you want to mute yourself? Okay, I did. It's our higher there. Um, Early uh, diagnostic and treatment of uh, antibiotics is uh, very important as it uh, decreases mortality uh, significantly and also cost, uh, cuts costs of uh, hospitalization. Um, point of care uh, diagnostic tests are uh, very important for this issue as uh, they allow rapid diagnostics and uh, a treatment that is uh, rapidly available and uh, useful. Um, antimicrobial uh, resistance is a major risk as it uh, gives rise to um, um, resistant bacterial strains that uh, would be um, resistant to uh, usual antibiotics and require use of uh, more toxic drugs. And sometimes they are completely resistant. And due to the lack of uh, low cost diagnostics, health practitioners in these uh, resource constrained environments are uh, forced to prescribe antibiotics um, uh, and even when they do not know the infectious agent, uh, therefore rapid, uh, easy to use and inexpensive diagnosis should be applied in order to ensure the sustainability of antibiotics in the long run. Uh, next slide, please, Tyler. Um, currently, we're still uh, brainstorming for uh, solutions, but here are some we found uh, very interesting. There is a Febri-Dex, which is a two biomarker immune assay that uh, uses the host immune response to determine the infection agents. Uh, results uh, in this are obtained in 10 minutes and it costs $15 per test, but uh, it cannot be used on children under two years old as they have a different immune response. Um, also, there is a, a solution under development. Uh, this was from a, a Stanford team and they use the immune profiling using uh, seven genes uh, expression to determine the infection agent. Um, all this shows that the, there isn't a frugal uh, readily available uh, solution yet. Do we think this is a very urgent and important issue? Um, can you do the next slide? Uh, our team is uh, still new. We haven't uh, met everyone, but uh, uh, we're looking for a mentor. And so we would love to help in that. And uh, this is a picture of uh, a ch child in uh, Niger, part of a uh, study that uh, involved the use of antibiotics and it showed a reduction of 30% in mortality rate by applying antibiotics. Um, so it. time's up, Benny, that's fantastic. And then I think for all the folks that are looking for mentors, I'll I'll connect those links already both, not just in our current panel of mentors, but also from outside as well. Uh, next, we have Deborah Schmidt. So Deborah, I am... Uh, yes, okay, Deborah, can, perfect, we can hear you. Awesome, hi, I'm Deborah. I'm a research software engineer from Dresden in Germany, and I'm talking on behalf of my group called FUGLU, which is short for <laughs> Google Glucose Testing. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, yeah. 
Um, so um, our audience are people living with diabetes and they all have in common that they have a problem keeping their blood glucose levels in a healthy range. And if you don't do that, you can either die or your organs might suffer long-term damage. And um, we thought about an extended problem space, so for example, designing an open source pump. They are super expensive or lowering the cost of insulin. But what we focus on for now is um, glucose measurement because information is really the basis of any treatment. And if you have, for example, a continuous monitor device, as I have on my arm here, you get a nice curve. As you see on the top here, you know exactly what's happening. You know, when you're eating, when you're active, or when you're nervous about giving a talk, you see all of that. <laughs> but if you use test strips, as um, most people do, you only get a couple of values a day. You see that in the graph below, and you're missing out on so much information. And if you imagine the test strip is, uh, some people from our group reported about $1 it's a strip, that can be um, $6 a day, and that's already lots of money for many people. And this is why we want to lower the cost of repeated glucose level measurements. Next slide, please. Yes, so we are exploring, we, we want to look at existing commercial solutions and um, figure out why they're expensive, if we can do this in a frugal way. And um, they are, for example, based on spectroscopy, microwaves, radio waves, ultrasound. There's lots of um, information literature available and existing on our Notion page. Next, oh, yes, and we want to um, talk to initiatives who ha might have the same common goals. There's, for example, one from the EU is called Open Diabetes, and we should talk to them. Now the next slide. Yes, so we are many people. We are 15 to 20 people, and we need to split up somehow soon. Um, so, and that's also why I want to mention if any of the mentors are interested in something from the extended problem space, for example, the open source pump, we could also split up in this way. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to know what people are excited about who could help us with that. Um, yeah. We bring a wide range of um, really exciting expertise that fits the problem. But we are looking especially for people who know about diabetics or um, biomedical devices, who know about optics, electronics, microfluidics, paper diagnostics, and do-it-yourself stuff, fabrication. And if we want to tackle microwaves, I got uh, told that we need access to a vector network analyzer. So if you have one, let us know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, awesome. Since there is 10 seconds still left, one comment I was going to make, it's perfectly OK. You have really gathered as a team around a problem. And this is large enough a problem that we will be able to break that into chunks that there is certain connections between the teams. But at that same time, there are sub problems that are tackling. But it's perfectly yeah, yeah. okay for the entire team to really act as a cohesive unit. Because we all know the larger the problem you take, you need that level of expertise. So this is a fantastic thread. Uh, it's, next. it's difficult to engage with everyone when there are so many people. That's why we will break them into subgroups, while awesome. once a while you will all come together and update each other. Yeah, that's a great plan. Thank you. Next is Floor. Hola. All yours, Floor. Floor is yours. <laughs> so, at the beginning of the pandemic, inequalities of the have become more visible. One of the issues are the access to education. The most affected are always the minorities without access to privilege, such as people who have an internet or even who has an access to school right now such as a deep population in a situation of poverty, people with love resources that are even with um, the government implement uh, cannot have access to this education because um, there's a lot of issues. So even there's population who have an, uh, electric services so in Mexico, since 1920, the free text program for basic education was implemented, trying to reach the entire Mexican population. Um, however, four of five people live in poverty. This is not the only country who has this problem. So this problem increased in places that have not taken in account. For example, here in Oaxaca, we have 570 municipalities 
and in this state we are we have seven ethnic groups 16 of them are originals 12 languages are spoken on 11 languages are native and most of the textbooks are on spanish so that's a really big problem the level of schooling is on low course so only finish elementary school. So how do you explain what is happening in the world right now? So the science education and science communication share some common, common objectives, including seeking to educate, entertaining, stimulate, sustain, in, and further critical engagement of the young minds and around science. In the context of engagement of our audience with science, sharing knowledge is always uh, there's always a uh, way that interested this as a key element of science communications. Some of the best approach are approach of growing scientist curiosity includes science communication as a dialogue with the public, expressing scientists, knowledge and photograph manner of using the language of cartoons that appeal the thought process of the audience. Like we are trying to move to make our scientists, scientists facts that wave in the form of stories affects rapid emotions to nurture engagement with science and visual storytelling to help connect abstract or complex sciences info the audience. This is why through the designs and implementation of Grammify, we try to include and satisfy these needs. So my next question is who wants to join? <laughs> uh, so time's up uh, and I think this is a perfect way for teams to actually also uh, recruit uh, there is a chat for you floor you should look at the link that was just listed there next is Evelyn May uh, hey everyone perfect Evelyn all you awesome um, good morning good afternoon good evening everyone <laughs> um, we are team negotiation villain and the problem we want to address that is, according to a study, 61% of people in the U.S. left money on the table without negotiating their job offer. And it, it is also found that female are much less likely to negotiate their salaries than male. Uh, it's 45% uh, versus 68%. And for many of them, that could be um, the first job that they get in their life. And that, that extra uh, 1,000 bucks could have meant a new bookshelf or uh, several t nutritious meals or, a pro or, or uh, maybe even a movie night for the family. So why do they leave money on the table? And there are also many other occasions in their lives where negotiation skills are needed for example, buying a used car from a car dealer, getting a lower rent from a landlord. So good negotiation skills help them save money. However, the existing negotiation trainings are mainly tailored to corporate professionals in the context of sales and partnerships um, and personal negotiation coaches do exist, although very few, um, but it's very expensive. The lowest rate that I could find was uh, $99 per hour, uh, which is insanely expensive for those who need them the most. So the question here is how can we uh, democratize negotiation skills and make this life-saving education available to everyone? And this is our solution. Proposed solution is a virtual negotiation uh, agent um, as a chatbot. And it will create a gamified learning experience to the user. And some components maybe, uh, the core one is uh, quote unquote, summon the, uh, the villain, uh, which is the villain will, will be your negotiation opponent and might be your future boss or the uh, car dealer. And then you can practice this negotiation beforehand um, practice several um, strategies, uh, several rounds of them, and then uh, have like that kind of mem uh, uh, mental preparation and experience before going into a real negotiation. And the technology piece here uh, is 
um, uh, first of all, Google Dialogflow as the infrastructure. And then we will use the state-of-the-art natural language processing um, uh, tool, which is GPT-3 that's recently launched by OpenAI. And then the, um, the uh, front-end channel will be uh, WhatsApp. WhatsApp. And then the team. So this is the current team. Well, up to today, there are actually four, four of us. One of them just dropped off. So uh, we need uh, not only computer science programming kind of background, but also general design. So uh, conversation design, um, um, user experience design, and graphic design, any uh, experience is welcome. Mm -hmm. So Thank time's you. up. So that was fantastic. A very unusual solution to a very important problem. Uh, next is Ben Ginsley. And I think, Ben, you're already unmuted. Yeah, audio check? Yes. Great. All good. Cool. Hi, so my name is Ben Ginsley. I'll be pitching for the HABs or the Harmful Algal Blooms team. So algae and phytoplankton are some of the oldest organisms that inhabit the Earth, and they perform a lot of amazing ecosystem services. However, in the right conditions, they can multiply rapidly in what is called a bloom. Specific genera or species of algae are known to produce toxins, which, when released into the environment, even in very low concentrations can be poisonous or even lethal to wildlife, um, aquatic animals, of course, but this also includes terrestrial animals and humans. These organisms represent wide ranges of genetic and phenotypic diversity, and the toxins they can produce are likewise quite diverse. As a side note, economic damage estimation is also a highly understudied dimension of this problem. Figures are few and far between and span numbers from tens of millions to billions of dollars in damages annually at various regional scales. So the key challenge is detecting when an algae bloom is beginning to provide enough warning to mitigate the bloom or otherwise avoid it. Next slide, please. The design space on this problem is two main domains, optical methods and molecular methods. The optical methods focus on what I call proxy measurements. These are indirect estimates of toxin risk from parameters ranging from turbidity and optical density to pigment measurements like measuring chlorophyll to whole cell imaging for taxonomic classification. This is a relatively crowded solution space that still faces a gap in the low cost field deployed implementation quadrant. And ultimately it falls short of giving a direct readout on the biological endpoint, which is environmental toxin concentration. Molecular methods can provide more accurate taxonomic or chemical information, but have so far been very difficult to implement in the field at low cost. Narrowing the problem scope a little bit, this leads us to the design question, can we develop a frugal field assay for cyanotoxins? Our initial hypothesis is that we may be able to design a combined or orthogonal assay that uses color metric and or paper-based approach to meet the requirements of field deployment at low cost. Next slide. The team members are active in our Discord channel or are listed here. So we have Georgie at Stanford in the US, Ben, that's me, at Northeastern in the US, and Swati's at MIT ADT in India. We have some foundational knowledge about molecular biology, machine learning, optical and imaging approaches, and algal biology but we're absolutely still open to adding more contributors to the project. This is a huge problem. And either as team members or mentors, you know, some of the suggested expertise we're looking for are knowledge about marine environment specifically, as well as implementing molecular approaches in a paper-based format. Anyone is welcome to connect on Notion and Discord. That's where we do most of our chatting. So thanks, Ben. Perfect. Uh, and a comment that I'll make here, we, since we have 10 seconds, Ben, uh, we will bring in, uh, We've been working with the government in Chile with a few group of uh, algal scientists trying to map toxic algae. So as a field site and a very direct uh, challenge in Chile uh, and lots of expertise on uh, microalgae. Yeah, uh, thanks. Okay, the next person is Alicia Collins. And... Hi, everybody. Um, so the problem space we are looking at, so as Tyler is uh, loading the slides, but we are looking at this science education situation. And if you notice, there's this kind of dichotomy. On the one hand, there are so many schools or communities that does not have access to tools. While on the other hand, there are so many schools and spaces that have so much access to tools, but you have like science lab uh, microscope collecting dust or the approach is more like you want to learn how to ride a bicycle but you're teaching about the parts but also like how to balance but nobody has an actual experience of riding a bicycle so from that point of view we are also looking at this lack of agency and relevance as well as equity in science education 
um, there's this report that uh, children whose parents are in STEM field are more likely to pursue those career and develop interest at a young age. While on the other hand, you have so many communities that don't necessarily see themselves as being in that field. And on top of it, we have science miscommunication and misconception, especially during this pandemic where we have political leaders saying uh, science doesn't know. Um, so the whole COVID situation has kind of amplified all these problems. We have 463 million children whose schools are closed, partially or completely. One in those three children are missing out on remote learning. Uh, so there's a space about like, can we uh, bring foster more fluency in science through more accessible pathways, not just for children, but also for their families and communities to engage in more hands-on scientific outdoor experiences. And from the design lens, we are looking at designing more artistic and cultural pathways for introducing science as a way of life and not just a discipline, as well as improving fluency through more curiosity and interest-driven hands-on experiences. Uh, and one of the idea that we are speculating, if you can go to the next slide, is this Google backpack. Now, although on the slides you would see a lot of tools, but I think our approach is more holistic and more contextual. Um, so we are looking at four of those aspects, creativity and playfulness, citizen science, community more empowerment, so it's not do it yourself, but do it with others, as well as communication and storytelling. So you're not just using sensors and going out on the field, uh, looking at what happens, but also you're trying to tell a story. You're collaborating with the wind or water to actually construct something. Um, so here we have like a range of things which are already there foldoscope, centrifuge, uh, but also some more artful exploration like watercolor chemistry kit, as well as an attachment where people can trace. Um, but if you just like deploy the backpack, that's not enough. So we are trying to see how we can continue this exploration by bringing more comic book periodicals that can go in the newspapers, but also more like radio shows or podcasts that can reach to people who do not have uh, smartphones. Uh, but also speculating if there's a possibility to have more community. And if you go to the next slide, um, so we have very diverse team, uh, very excited to work together. Uh, we are all very interdisciplinary, but you can see our skills that are most prominent. And we are looking at more expertise in citizen science, environmental sensing, and PCB design, um, especially for one of the product that we're looking at sound waves from more inanimate objects in nature and how to collect that. Uh, time's up. This is absolutely fabulous and so much uh, threads to connect on, um, which I'll follow up. Uh, next is Ajay uh, Subramanian. I'm going to try to unmute. Hello. I just could me? just listen to all of you for days almost. This is so much fun. I wish we had more time. Okay, Ajay, all yours. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ajay. I'm speaking on behalf of our team um, who's trying to answer the question outlined above here, which is how can we improve access to treatment and diagnosis of epilepsy? Um, I have a, cute, a few quick facts about epilepsy, which is one of the most common neurological disorders in the world um, and most common as well globally. And nearly 80% of people with epilepsy live in low and middle income countries and three quarters of those people don't get the treatment that they need. Um, and I think one of the most unique aspects of epilepsy as a neurological disorder is that it also, uh, because of the nature of epilepsy, which is uncontrollable seizures as the pathology, in a lot of parts of the world, especially in low resource settings, that pathology is associated with things that are not scientific. It's associated with stigmas, associated with even the supernatural in certain cultures and communities. And that prevents people from accessing the care and quality of care that they need um, to recover from that, uh, such a debilitating illness. And so the, ch the, ch the challenges here are, are outlined on the right, which is, you know, what are the technical constraints around diagnosing epilepsy and how can we potentially frugalize those to improve access? Um, and what barriers are there to even acquiring a diagnose, uh, diag uh, diagnosis to begin with? Not only is that access to a clinician, um, but it can also be the personal stigma that the community has with seeking help for such a, a disorder like epilepsy. Uh, and lastly, kind of, we want to try to think about holistically solving this problem by thinking about cultural education, science education in the context of neurological disorder. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, 
our solution space, I think from our brainstorming, uh, kind of encompasses three categories, but also the intersection of all of them. So uh, one of the most important uh, things to, one of the most important statistics that we learned from the literature is that um, if your current treatments to epilepsy, like the anti-epileptic drugs are actually really effective. The problem is people don't use them regularly or don't have access to them to begin with. So thinking about solutions that leverage even the current solutions that are used in more developed regions of the world could be a one approach. Second, and the approach that is also really exciting is thinking about engineering new frugal technology, including something called ambulatory EEG or electroencephalography, which is basically a way for us to read the brain. Uh, almost 70% of EEGs that are ordered in hospitals in the developed world are for epilepsy and bringing access and care to uh, with that kind of medical device in these kinds of regions could be a great way to increase the number of people that get an accurate diagnosis and then find treatment. And then lastly, as I was hinting to earlier, is adjusting the non-technical strategies for epilepsy care, things like neuropsychological exams, evaluations, and surveys, and kind of adjusting them to be culturally competent and take into account the stigmas that may occur in these sorts of um, communities. And the overlap of all of these uh, is also something we're exploring. In fact, in, you know, one really exciting idea is thinking about musical neurotherapy, which is something we came across in our literature search, which could integrate the culture of a place and their music into the way they seek care and could maybe provide a route to destigmatization. Um, but in, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Overall, we're looking for the overlap of all four of these categories together to provide a new holistic paradigm for treating epilepsy. Our current team is here, Abhishek, Vani, Cecilia, Sessi, and myself. Um, and uh, we're all in, kind of in the neuro space, which was so interesting when we met each other. And so when we are, we are really looking for partners and mentors that have access to, that have a understanding of the patient care that, that goes into treating people with epilepsy, thinking th uh, people with expertise on bringing frugal technology to a new community and understanding destigmatization, especially around um, epilepsy, neurological disorders and mental health stigma. Yeah. Awesome, time's up. Uh, and I think one of the things we will do is connect uh, with a mentor uh, in a, low income setting as well, because that sets the challenge very clearly. Fantastic. Uh, next, we have Archana. And uh, okay, Archana. Uh, yeah, hello, am I audible? Yes. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to start with the little story. Um, so there is a story of village far, far away from the modern world and from the terms of technology. There are children and they are employed. Some from very young age, like two years old, they work, their work is to extract shiny things from rock and dust. They collect them by their hands, put them in the box, clean them and cut and arrange them according to size and look. And finally, they give all those shiny things to the world and left with nothing. They don't even know what they are collecting. Let's just look up around you and try to find out those shiny things. Please go to the next slide. It's there in all your electronic devices, paint and coating in cosmetics in all our daily life products. Yeah, go back to the story again. Oh, some of children are injured, some got some diseases, but don't worry, they are not going to stop working because they have to eat something at least once in a day. Because they have to filter the high demand of those shiny things and far, and for that, all that needed is more hands to work so that sometimes they are forced to do that. Finally, after working whole day and collecting one kg of those shiny things, they got three to ten rupees. That is four to fourteen cents. And the market size of those things is one dollar to two thousand dollars. So. Now children are going back to home with dust covered and keeping those shiny things inside their body. They will come back again to bring shine in our world because they don't know how school looks like. They don't know how drinking water tastes. They don't even know about their rights. So that's the story of children from the country like India, Madagascar and Pakistan where devil cost is very low. So. I hope this story already explains the problem statement. So I might now 
coming back to the possible solution. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So it's really complex problem and hard to come up with the one idea. But what we all have in our mind is like, can we design some fuel machinery for the mining so that that is not expensive and not automated and that can help labor to improve their collection and efficiency and working environment. And the most important thing, the person who don't have any experience with technology and kind of tools, can they also can easily adopt this machinery and and they at the end they get to more collection and yeah so uh, please go to the next slide so our in our team member uh, i from the applied physics and the data science background and say with the gyan and uh, puja uh, she is from microbiology uh, nanotech and the background and we all need to uh, like people from the different background, like Mica and mining expert, material science expert, Mica mining engineering, human rights expert, healthcare. Like we need from all background people from all background and also the mentor. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, Archana, Thank I want to I want to interject and say one thing. Just your last three minutes is really just the reason we all came together. You know, in the three minutes you summarized the why we are all here as humans thinking about this. I have a tear in my eye when I think about this. And the fact that it just, for such a long time, we can look away, it just bothers all of us so much. And I can guarantee you right in this room, in this call is the talent we need to tackle this. And again, once we really focus, this is really the reason we're all here together. So just kudos to, I mean, not just you, every team, you're all pouring your heart into thinking about this. And it is extremely important for the diverse group of people to be thinking about this because that's really when we can't, a technologist can't do this alone. Uh, a social worker can't do this alone. These are such complex problems. I just you you've just summarized why we are here together. Um, yeah, I just yeah. I, I don't know. I can't stop. I can't continue. Uh, it's you know again. It really just highlights why we're all here together. Okay, sorry for that uh, break. Aim. We're next, uh, and then I'll. Uh, once we are going through the sets of uh, uh, feedback cycles, uh, there is a lot more number of very specific mentors that we would also bring on each one of these problems. So kind of watch out for that for this week. Uh, okay, I think Haim, I am unmuting you now. Hello, thank you, Tyler and Manu. I'm Haim and I will present in the name of our team, which also consists of Arshi, Alex, Sajal and Marion. Our project is about creating a low-cost ultrasound machine. Today, ultrasound is a crucial part of almost all parts of healthcare. For emergency care, it is crucial for diagnosing patients in the field, such as in the case of chest pain or abdominal pain, in which case an ultrasound can help diagnose the source of the pain. And it is very useful to physicians in the clinic and in the hospital. Usually ambulances don't have an ultrasound in them. In Israel, only 0.2% of ambulances have an ultrasound and a trained physician to understand the image. There are two reasons why ultrasound machines are rare. The first one is because ultrasound machines are expensive, costing usually more than $800 and usually costing between $20,000 and $100,000. The other reason why ultrasound machines are rare is because it takes a lot of training to be able to read an image or a video of ultrasound. Sometimes the training to interpret such an image can take up to two years. Can you please uh, switch to the next slide? And Tyler? Thank you, Tyler. Uh, the cost is generally due to two parts. The first one is, soft, is hardware and the second is software. To solve the problem of the hardware, there are two solutions that can be combined. One is the use of a voice coil. Instead of using an array of sensors, you can use only one sensor that you, that you move using the voice coil. The second solution is to use a CMUT technology, which is a cheaper 
which is cheaper than the current technology that uses the piezoelectric effect to generate and receive ultrasound. To solve the problems with the software, there are two solutions. One is to integrate the software so that it uses phones, as smartphones are omnipresent. And the second solution is to use AI to decipher the image. Can you please move to the next slides? Slide, Tyler. Thank you. Yep, should be on the next one. These are, these are the expertise we have and the skills we are missing. And we will be glad if you joined our team as a member. We need someone with expertise in ultrasound, electronics, micro-machining, and many more. We still require a mentor to move on with the project. We will be glad if you joined our team. Thank you for listening. Uh, perfect. And I think, yeah, there is two or three very specific mentors in mine, Haim, that I'll connect. Uh, Thank next you. is uh, Jacob. Uh, let me just confirm that it is Jacob. Uh, Yep, that should be right. Yeah, okay. So Jacob, see if you... Yep, I'm muted now. Perfect. All right, awesome. So uh, this presentation may not be as like uh, nice and pretty on the outside. I, I really just put three pictures together, but I'm happy to explain everything um, in words. All right, so I'm Jacob. I'm someone who graduated from high school last year and I'll be heading to Rice to start my undergraduate um, next year. So I'm one of the more junior members of the team, but this is team Altpack. And what we're really trying to do is we're looking at plastic packaging and thinking how we can change it, but in one very specific niche. So evidently we discuss paper and we discuss cardboard as really good alternatives to plastic in a lot of different packaging. Specifically, I think of like paper, bags as well as um, paper straws and paper packaging for a lot of different things. But one place it falters is when you start to work with liquid and moist materials. So paper um, will absorb these materials and therefore cannot effectively contain them. I think specifically of things like laundry detergents. Um, you have pens which have to be made um, in plastic as well. And also you think of just like um, kind of these things that have wipes inside of them they can't effectively, um, paper can't effectively contain them. And that's why we turn to plastic for those hydrophobic um, non-reactive properties. So the idea is where can we get a material that is both biodegradable and, and not gonna create so much waste the way that plastic does, and yet still does not, uh, enables us to effectively contain these moist materials. Uh, so if you could move to the next one. Yeah, and also one other thing I wanna mention is we initially thought of doing this for paper-based diagnostic tests for medically and also potentially for food. However, because of the regulations surrounding those areas, we hope to develop it first for these less um, kind of dangerous things like laundry detergent and wipes and then later scale it, um, hopefully. Now, here's the issue in terms of price, right? So alternative materials are all well and good However, at present, they are nowhere near the cost effectiveness of plastic itself. So you can see the per ton is relatively similar. However, it just requires so much more, literally a factor of four to use alternative materials. And obviously this is a basket statistic that's using a lot of different alternate materials. But the ones that we specifically are thinking about are really cellulose-based uh, plant materials. So we think specifically right now things like onion peel, water lily, and potentially even palm fronds could be um, useful in terms of creating something out of them and really making that work to contain the moisture. Um, so please move to the next one. Um, and we really think about kind of the, um, the coating that you see just naturally on these plants as being able to help us with the hydrophobic properties. Now, we really need a mentor. We're a big team. Uh, you know, I, I was speaking with a, a few of the members, um, Laura and Swamp Mill earlier, but we really have about um, eight members, but what we don't have is a mentor. And we need someone with some uh, definitely material science um, knowledge, because that's not something that all of us have. Some of our current uh, like skills that we have are biotechnology, chemical engineering, conservation and public policy. Um, so very interesting skill set that we already have, but definitely the material science. And we also want to look into process optimization. So obviously great idea to use onion peel, right? But where are you gonna get a large enough quantity that you can mass produce um, this kind of packaging? And that's what we really wanna think about. Um, so we're done on time, but thank you all for listening and we really hope we can find a mentor and we're super open to ideas from other members of the course. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect. And I think, yeah, I'll cover on the mentor side for everybody offline. 
Uh, next is uh, Dr. Drashtant, but I don't know your Zoom ID. So for the next member of the team, could they type and chime in on Zoom so that I can unmute? Otherwise, we'll have to move to the next. Uh, do you know any other name, Tyler, that I should unmute? I don't, unfortunately. Okay, so let's move to the next one and we'll come back to this. Uh, so the next is Sung. Uh, so Sung, I'm just unmuting you. Uh, Sung, can you hear us? Hello. Perfect. All yours. Is this working? Yes. Go ahead, Sung. Hello? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Sung, can you hear us? I'm sorry. It's... Oh, okay. <laughs> we can hear you very well. Yes, yes, I can. All right. Good Hello. afternoon, folks. Uh, I'm Sung. All right. Uh, I'm Sung representing the team Micro Evo Devo um, on theme, how can we track microbial evolution in aquatic ecosystems? Uh, let's see. Originally, our idea began as just tracking microbial evolution, and then we quickly realized it was an overly broad topic to begin with. So uh, we, this entire slide is really the process of us just trying to narrow down the question. All right. Uh, so, first of all, we decided immediately to focus on the aquatic ecosystem. 70% of the planetary surface consists of water, 97% is saline, 3% is just fresh water. Now, it's easy to imagine that the water, the aquatic environment around the planet as being some empty space. Respect. Just bacteria, other two hundred million freshwater phages lie on top of each is going to about six million light years long. Um, to put that number into perspective, the diameter of the Milky Way is expected to be about hundred. Very... Sung, your your voice is voice is cracking, so we hear kind of half the threads. of the old half of humanity live within three percent area. Sung, your your voice isn't coming through. Um, yeah, maybe let's do this, Tyler. That river is accelerating uh, the urban popular uh, global urban. I think what has happened is whatever Sung has said is now in the buffer, and the interweb is releasing that from. Uh, That's right. <laughs> let's yeah. let's put that Sung. Let's put your talk in the very end to see uh, whether. Sung, can you hear us? Okay, I'll move to Scott first and then Skung, we'll bring you in the very end again. So can you, uh, Tyler, can you share the... Got it, yep. Okay. So next is Scott. Scott Piper. Uh, Scott, you are unmuted. Okay. And yep. Skung, we'll get back to you in the very end. You can go for it. Sorry for the buffering. Oh, yeah. No. Okay, so uh, we are beyond the tent, which uh, we're focusing on improving health care for refugees. Uh, so to sort of frame the problem, there are 26 million refugees worldwide, and that's not including people who are internally displaced. That makes up about 1% of the world population, and about 40% of those people are children. Uh, and 85% of refugees end up being hosted in another resource-limited nation, which provides additional barriers. 63% uh, of health problems in refugee camps are related to the living conditions, uh, which includes malnutrition, which is especially bad for mothers dealing with issues like anemia, as well as infectious diseases, which can spread rampantly in uh, close quarters. And there's also the uh, barrier of quantifying the burden of mental illness. The American Psychiatric Association uh, estimates that 20 to 80% of people are refugees are affected. 
Uh, however, that's a really wide range and it's not very well defined. Uh, depression and PTSD are some of the most uh, common afflictions, but it's also very complex because there's pre and post flight stressors uh, that can play into mental health. There's also many social factors that influence healthcare. Uh, there can be misconceptions that refugees may be bringing more illness into a country. Uh, however, uh, the WHO has shown that HIV is more commonly acquired once refugees arrive into their host country. And there's also many language and cultural differences. Next slide, please. So looking at the potential solution space, we kind of divided up the whole um, spectrum of healthcare for refugees into different sections. So we looked at basic needs, uh, diagnoses, which can include diagnoses for cancer, infectious diseases, as well as, uh, as well as other screenings. And then there's treatments, which can take the form of surgery, antiretroviral treatment, or chemo or radiation, or other procedures. Um, but next slide, oh, please. We're gonna focus mainly on the basic needs section, um, dealing with issues like primary care, sanitation, safety, and nutrition, as well as we really wanna look into um, the area of the ratio of doctors to the refugee population, as well as empowering people to use the skills uh, that they have in their community to help improve the situation. So moving forward to our team, uh, I have a background in medical devices, technical writing, and biosystems engineering. Uh, Janissa has experience in global health, epidemiology, and women's health. Jal has uh, experience in bioanalytical sciences and genetics. And Vidya has experience with global health, women's health, and mental illness. So really what we are looking for and missing is someone with firsthand experience um, working ideally in the field or uh, has worked on a project before with uh, something dealing with refugees uh, because we don't have that experience um, and we don't wanna blindly be making decisions. We really wanna be uh, informed that what we're doing is actually helping. So we're really looking for someone that has experience working with refugees. Awesome, thank you, Scott. And did you get the uh, Discord message I sent about connecting with Jude? Yes, yeah, we sent him a message uh, when he came back from him, so yeah. Okay, so let's move to next, which is uh, Kavya. Uh, and I think one of the things that I'm thinking about looking at the number of people, there is still maybe 10, 14 teams still left. So I'm thinking of using the first 45 minutes of the next class uh, as a way, because otherwise it would stretch to be too long. So we'll still, we might just keep the class at the right time itself because it'll be too late in India and then use the first half. So for some of you who didn't get to go as yet, you'll get a chance to go next week essentially. But let's keep going until the two o'clock time. Sounds great. So Kavya, back to you. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm talking on something a lot of people have already covered that is plastic waste, but uh, we'll be focusing on plastic waste, which is generated by research laboratories. Um, there are two main uh, data points that I would like to bring up when uh, I'm talking about like plastic waste generated by research laboratories. Uh, there was one study done uh, by eLife. It was a social media campaign where they had asked uh, everyone uh, on Twitter to uh, put out um, the amount of waste that they generate, uh, an, a scientist generates in a day. And uh, they found that an, on an average that uh, uh, like people who have participated in that study um, generated about 300 to 400 um, grams of waste. And another study, which, in, which was in 2015, showed that um, we generate about 5.5 million tons of plastic waste uh, each year uh, in the name of research. And that actually contributes to 2% of the like amount of plastic waste produced in the whole world, uh, which is pretty uh, insane. Uh, and our uh, goal is to make um, science more sustainable and environmentally friendly. Uh, and we aim to find solutions uh, which are uh, scalable and adoptable at the same time. Uh, could you go on to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so uh, we realized that our um, solutions cannot just be about science and technology. Uh, there is a major networking and social aspect to it where there needs to be uh, like, it needs to spread well and it needs to be easily adoptable. Um, that will be uh, one of the main things that we or that will be one main thing that we have to focus on. The next uh, like thing we want to think about while we're thinking of solutions are disposables. What are better alternatives to disposables? 
Uh, one of the main contenders for this is Plastarch. Uh, it's, a, it's a starch based uh, thermoplastic material. Uh, it is biodegradable and um, it has a lot of properties which could possibly make it suitable for Petri dish is what we're thinking as of now. Uh, we'll see where it goes uh, on more iterations. Uh, other options are obviously biodegradable plastics, which are like coconut, actin, and jute based. Uh, and like another idea of thinking would be limiting the packaging from the source, like from the producer end, like what are the ways we could reduce them. And mealworms is another thing which came about. They are uh, worms which have enzymes which can digest styrofoam. Uh, it has a little bit more bottlenecks, but we'll see uh, how, this is just the brain dump for now. Um, another main thing which we would also like to think about is uh, the cost benefit analysis of reducing versus reusing and recycling. Uh, as of now, these are things which are dismissed upon uh, by saying that they could be very costly. Uh, let's just see if it is so, because we don't wanna just uh, end up having more uh, materials which are produced and uh, ignore the ones which are already existing. Um, as for our team, uh, we mainly have like cell and um, tissue culture based people uh, who uh, work in a research uh, setting. Um, there is also a high schooler um, and uh, we do have a little bit of people who are uh, in the field of programming. We would want um, Antin is our mentor from Manu's lab. Uh, he uh, has a little bit of material science experience if I'm right and there are other, we would like more people with uh, good knowledge on material science and science communication is another field mm -hmm. where we are. Like Time's up. Uh, you, what I find special about this team is this is a team that is its own audience. So you guys probably understand the problem very well. Uh, so moving to the, probably what we'll end up doing is this is going to be the last talk and then we can spend a minute or two on just reflections and appreciate all the work that you've done. So next is Fur. Uh, and so... I think there were three names in that, but uh, I'm just going to unmute for, unless I should be unmuting somebody else. Is that okay for, sorry, let me unmute you first. Uh, ask to unmute. Ah. Hi. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest hi hi. that we all heard. So awesome. sorry. <laughs> Lower is all yours. Okay. Uh, then, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Work together. Okay. Work together. Okay. 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 Something is going on with. Okay. You. Now we're good. Now it's so, go ahead. Uh, so we we made this uh, idea internal idea board and I don't know to state the problem, but to gather all the things that we thought that might be a dimension of the problem. Can you please? Yeah, um, next one. Next, uh -huh. Tyler, next I slide. think you have to scroll it. Yeah, yeah okay. cool. So we have this very uh, uh, big dimensions uh, on this problem is the social one, the economic one and the health itself. So we cannot address uh, the, a particular issue because we might be incurring in the very uh, design issue that we appreciate on today's pregnancy testing. So we wanna focus on the diagnose part, but um, we, we decided to take the very three main uh, issues on the social, is the absolute technical control of diagnosis and it's being encrypted by the whole medical system. And it's, no, it's not allowing uh, every woman on earth to take care of themselves and get to know what is going on in their own bodies. The economic dimension is uh, the price because you have to take maybe two um, pregnancy tests to really make sure that you're pregnant or, or not pregnant. And this also impacts the health dimension because uh, a delay on the di diagnosis um, also has uh, this very sort bad of a, sort of impact on the choices a woman can take uh, with respect to her pregnancy. And the intersections between 
between these three dimensions are giving us the research guidelines to really propose uh, better strategy. So between the economic and the social, we have the a very unaccessible design for everybody. And between the health and the social, we have stigmatization, which also needs to be addressed. And between the health and the economic, we have a lot of misinformation because it's not that information does not exist. You have to be on a certain uh, economic range of uh, uh, to like get for to you know to access that uh -huh. information. So we should be able to know if we're pregnant as it is, as it is to know that we have a fever. So. Uh, this is because uh, design isn't considered on a cultural thing. So this is the main uh, guidelines that we want to research that we are already uh, making a lot of research on to design the strategy. And it's certainly a product we don't know yet, but um, it's contemporary diagnose saliva, via sensors glucometers, blood, pee. Lateral flow assay too might be the solution. We still don't know, don't, do not know yet. And so if you can go to the next um, slide, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we as a team do not have um, a, a lot of knowledge, a, a technical knowledge yet. So we would be, uh, we're looking for people who have that and can tell us or guide us through it through the possible solutions. Yeah, but we're a very multidisciplinary uh, group. And that's good because uh, we can, like looking at everyone's projects, we know that uh, as a strategy and not necessarily the design of a new product, we might be able to implement a lot of the solutions that you're proposing on our project. So, uh, and also the solutions that we are proposing can be like even addressed as manuals, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. But we are looking for mentor, for friends, and also um, uh, knowledge for, uh, for us to be more designer-ish. So mm -hmm. you're very welcome mm -hmm. to be with us. And also this presentation has the guidelines. So yeah, yeah that's it. Um, okay, time's up. Uh one comment I was going to make for everybody who mentioned uh, on the mentor side. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we, we cannot hear you. We're not oh. sure why. Can you we all cannot hear, hear you, Manu. I think everybody else can. You have, oh, you can hear us? Okay. A comment I was going to make was, uh, what's beautiful about this is pregnancy test is given as the example of frugal science and attacking that in itself and understanding the challenges with it and it's still not frugal. I absolutely love the tagline, it should be as easy as detecting fever. Uh, so a few sets of comments and then we'll say goodbye and then continue the list in that same section on Thursday. I think maybe we were very ambitious to try to squeeze all of this, but I just, I just wanna mention something. It's absolutely humbling and touching to see what you have all come together and put together. All of you should just realize this, that it's just phenomenal. The self-assembly of the teams that has happened is exactly what we were hoping for with the kind of diversity. Just, I could not be more happy in how that has come together. And now we have just the right framework to tackle many of these problems. And I think very specially making sure, as Fur was saying in the very end, that Many of you will be developing a solution and a part of it would be directly applicable to somebody else. And this is why it's valuable to do this as a group and as a community, that although we are working on individual projects, there is a lot of pieces that are interconnected and we're not trying to compete with each other, but really push as far as we can on as many number of problems as possible. Uh, and this was a remarkable session. So just to end it, because it's already 2.04. Is there a way, Tyler, to unmute everybody? And we should just have a round of applause from everybody, which we have not done so far. But today is the perfect day to do something like that. I don't know if you have a one button. Yeah, let's end it. I hope we'll get We're going to get crazy echo, just like the hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. For you guys are awesome. And then we will see you next week.
Sorry, Manu, I accidentally <laughs> muted you. <laughs> uh, we will continue next week with the talks and then follow up on Discord and uh, the the list that you are using, Tyler, I'll use that to essentially assign a lot more mentors for the teams. And then the mentors who are able to connect, of course, can connect with any possible team that they want. Uh, but there is a lot of folks that we will add mentors to. And then again, now is really the start of the class. So I think now is the correct time to say is welcome to Frugal Science. Bye, everybody. Welcome. Wait, money, money, real quick, real quick, just to clarify. People were confused. So are we doing next on, on Thursday? Are we doing the Thursday continuation? We continue, we continue from that list that you have shared for the teams that were left and the few teams that had glitches. That's correct. Perfect. All right. See you all Thursday. See you on Discord, everybody.